All right, Judges chapter 1, page 200, if you're using one of the Bibles on the bench in front of you. Look, here's what we believe at Grace Central. We believe the Bible is, is the Word of God. We believe every page of it is the Word of God. That means every page of the Bible, every book of the Bible is worth our attention and our study. Some of the parts of the Bible are a little bit stranger than others. Some of them are a little bit disturbing uh, to us in our time and in our culture. But listen, God uh, is not disturbed by the same things that disturb us. He's disturbed sometimes by other things that we ought to be disturbed by. We come to the book of Judges. We will soon find the book of Judges is strange to our ears. It is weird. The stories are weird. For some of you, that will be disturbing. For some of you, you're really going to dig it. Uh, but what we need to remember is this is God's word, and that's why we study it. Judges chapter 1. Israel was in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. So the Lord raised up Moses to deliver them out of slavery. Through Moses, he led them through the Red Sea as the sea was parted and they went across on dry land into what? Into the promised land. God had promised not only to deliver them from slavery, but to give them a land of their own. They were in the wilderness. The wilderness was not the land that God had promised to give them. There was land beyond the wilderness. Eventually, Moses dies and it's Joshua, the new leader, who has the privilege of leading God's people into the land of promise. And so they cross through the Jordan River as God stops the water, they pass through on dry land into the promised land. The land that God had promised to give them. What was the problem? There were already tribes living there, the Canaanite tribes. Some places in scripture describe them as very tall, even as giants. They were powerful and they were wicked, but God had promised to deliver the tribes into the hands of his people in order that his people might possess the land that he'd promised to give them. In Judges chapter 1, we read that Joshua has now died, and the conquest of the land is incomplete. But the promise of the Lord still stands. He will deliver the land of promise into their hands if they will only believe and obey. This is the word of God. He himself is its ultimate author. Yes, he used people to write it, but his spirit working through them. God's word is fully true in all that it affirms, and it's simultaneously filled with prophetic symbolism and gospel imagery that runs like a thread from the first page of Genesis to the last page of Revelation. The book of Judges is no exception. Let's read Judges chapter 1. We'll start with verses 1 through 7. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we might fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him, and delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. I told you this is good stuff, right? And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. Let's pray. Father, your word is frequently weird. It's strange to us. We're separated by thousands of years of human history. But God, human nature has not changed, and you have not changed, and your promises have not changed, and our need for your promises have not changed. We pray that by your spirit you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what it is that you say. God, where we need to be disturbed, disturb us. Where we need to be comforted, comfort us. Father, drag us and our hearts in line with your heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
When we read a strange book like the book of Judges, one thing we need to keep in mind, and by the way, I hope you will read it as we're going through this. We're only going to be in the book of Judges for nine or ten weeks. There's 25 chapters. We're not going to have time to do every single chapter of it, right? So please, read along on your own at home. But listen, as we read a book like Judges, which is ancient and strange and written in a culture different from ours, inspired by the Holy Spirit, meant for our eyes to read, our ears to hear, yes, but so very different than everything we're used to reading, and their world is different than the world that we experience. What we need to do is keep our ears open for clues. When we hear repetition... We need to know God put it there for a reason. When we hear descriptions and details, we need to know God selected them for a reason. When we hear the stories in the book of Judges, we need to know that God chose to tell us these stories for a reason. And the story of the fall of Adonai Bezek happens first in the book of Judges for a reason. And every detail is there for a reason. Adonai Bezek, what a strange name. Adonai means Lord. Bezek means lightning. He is the Lord of lightning. Did you know that for a long time, starting in Scripture, lightning has been a symbol of Satan himself? Lightning, a symbol of Satan. Adonai Bezek, the Lord of lightning. God is telling us something about his rule and his reign in the world, about his intentions to conquer his enemies. Look at verse 7. Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off, used to pick up scraps under my table. Did you know that in Scripture, the number 70 is a number that frequently symbolizes, because this is an ancient book and they used all kinds of symbolism, accusing, including uh, numbers to symbolize things. The number 70 symbolized the completeness of all the nations of the world. In Genesis chapter 10, which comes right after the flood, right? The flood in chapter 6, 7, 8, and, and then chapter 9, right, we have the ending of the flood story. In chapter 10, we have a list of the nations of the world. How many are there? Seventy nations. And then in chapter 11, we have the Tower of Babel as the nations rebe rebel against God, and he confuses their language, and he scatters them. As God is, is confounding the impulse of all the nations to gather together and set themselves up over against God as the one sole ruler of the world, Adonai Bezek, Lord of Lightning, conqueror of 70 nations, the number symbolizing all the nations of the world. This is the first king conquered in the book of Judges. God is telling us his intentions to exert his power and his authority and his rule in the world so that even Satan himself, acting through the rulers and the powers of this world will not be able to thwart his purposes for his people. And God, through the, the tribe of Judah, gains the decisive victory. 10,000 of them fall. The number 10 throughout the Old Testament and into the New is a number of completion. It's all there is. The threat has been nullified. They cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Why? Look, they're, they're not the only ones to do this. Adonai Bezek himself says he had done that to 70 other kings. Why would you cut off somebody's thumbs and big toes? When you cut off their big toes, they can't run away. You cut off their thumbs, they can't draw a bow. You have nullified the threat. In verse 7, we see that Adonai Bezek, the conquered king, himself recognizes that the judgment he has received it's just, it's righteous, it's fair. Look at verse 7. Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. Two things. Number one, the conquered king recognizes the justice that has been done to him. Number two, he recognizes that even though it was Judah, a tribe, that came in and conquered, that really... It was God who did it. Just judgment from God against a satanic ruler with intentions to rule all nations, nullified by God, judged by God, and with perfect righteous judgment by God. 
The book of Judges wastes no time reminding us that the Lord is the victorious judge, the righteous judge over all the world, over all evil, and over all the nations. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, we read this, Finally, this is in the New Testament, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Christians, we are supernaturalists. We believe what it is that God's word teaches us about the supernatural world as well as the natural world. And what it tells us is there is a devil, there is a Satan, and there are demonic powers that are in places of authority in this world and who really, truly exert influence and rule. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Satan the prince in power of this world, of this air, a spirit who's at work in the sons of disobedience. That means he's at work, working influence in the hearts and the lives of people now who disobey him. In John chapter 16, verse 11, Jesus is talking about judgment, and he says, because the ruler of this world is judged. Jesus says, the ruler of this world presently is Satan, but has been judged by God. And this nexus between Satan at work in the hearts of people of disobedience, including those who are rulers in this world with influence and power, the nexus of these things coming together is personified in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, and called the beast. Evil is alive and well in the world, but God is the righteous judge of all the world who will, who will not stop at anything to make sure that his people's purposes are fulfilled and that they are protected and delivered from the evil one. And we live in a world where there's still evil, and we need a son of Judah to come and overthrow the powers of Satan and the evil order of this world for us. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 17. He had sent out 72 disciples to preach the gospel and do ministry in his name, and now they're coming back, right? The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus is that son of Judah. Revelation chapter 5 calls him the lion of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who delivers us from evil. And we're not just talking about abstract concepts of evil and disobedience, but he delivers us from the personal evil of Satan himself and all his minions, even as they exercise power through the authority structures of this world. So far... Seven chapters in, seven verses in, we seem to be doing pretty well. God is defeating their enemies. All of this seems to be going well, but, but we need to keep reading. What we see is that Israel veers off the tracks and actually throws her lot in with the wicked nations of the world. The pattern we will see throughout the book of Judges, I don't title my sermon series, uh, but if I did, maybe it'd be called failure, misery, grace, repeat, right? We have moral failure, spiritual failure, failure of faith, misery as a consequence. God extends grace. And shortly thereafter, the people fall right back into moral and spiritual failure. Failure, failure to fully obey and to complete the conquest, which God had told them to complete. Look at, look at chapter 1, verse 27. Remember, when there's repetition, we need to open our ears to it and say it's there for a reason. He's the, the, the book of Judges now is telling us about some of the tribes of Israel. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 28, when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. Verse 29, and Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of, of Kitron. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. 
Verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. Do you see what's happening? The people, in their disobedience to fully carry out that which God had told them to carry out, is met with resistance from the enemy. Failure. And it results in misery. Look at chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Disobedience leads inevitably to misery. When we think we know better than God, it inevitably leads to misery. Now, in the short term, it must have seemed to Israel like the easier path. Hey, we're in the promised land. We've, we've got rid of a lot of the enemy here that God told us to get rid of. So why should we go to war, extend ourselves, take that risk, fight a little more when we're already here and stuff's going okay? Failure to obey the Lord leads inevitably to misery. Look at chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, though. The Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Even in their rebellion, the Lord does not abandon them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. Mercy, mercy. Look, a lot of times, some of you who are familiar with the book of Judges might be under the impression that the people rebel, they suffer misery, they cry out to the Lord in repentance, and in response to their repentance, the Lord brings a judge to deliver them. But if you'll note, that's not actually what the text says. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. There's nothing there that speaks of their repentance. And in fact, if you look at verse 19, but whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. No authentic repentance is happening for the people of God here. But God in his grace, because he loves his children, even in the midst of their sin and rebellion, extends himself graciously in love to deliver them because of their suffering. Failure, misery, grace. Failure, misery, grace. Failure, misery, grace. What we'll see as we go through the book of Judges is that the history of God's people in the book of Judges is a downward spiral. Each, each chapter is darker than the one that comes before. The rebellion is deeper. Number one, not only does, not only does sin lead to misery, not only does, does disobedience lead us necessarily to, to, to misery because we're going against the grain of the way God created the universe, because we're going against the grain of the, the way God created our souls, because we're going against the one who loves us and has called us. But sin itself is a downward spiral. If we never come to repentance, we spiral into deeper and darker levels of sin. The pit only gets deeper. It only gets darker. It only gets drier. It only gets more miserable. And so the people of God in the book of Judges are experiencing Cycles of chaos and misery and rebellion and suffering and darkness. We would think if God had raised up a judge and delivered them, maybe then they would see his love and serve him only. But that's not what happens. They respond with only more of the same, but worse. Until they reach the bottom of the bottom in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 where it says this, so the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. 
By the way, all those tribes are known shorthand as the Canaanites in Scripture. That's what's confusing. The Canaanites were a particular tribe, and all these tribes are considered Canaanites, and sometimes they're listed by name. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. We have now, at this low point, in verse 6 of chapter 3, the intermarriage of the people of God with the Canaanites who did not honor the Lord, did not follow him, and who were supposed to have been removed from the land. The assimilation into the surrounding unbelieving culture is nearly complete. I know this does not win me any friends, but listen, if you're a Christian, God's plan for you is to marry another Christian. If you're a believer, God's plan is for you to marry another believer. When God's people married outside of their faith, it is never perceived as a good thing. It always leads, listen, when we think we're smarter than God, leads to misery and further down the dark spiral. If you find yourself in that situation now, know this, there is grace for us, even in our sin. God reaches out and is good. But God's plan was for Israel not to make peace with the Canaanites, not to, certainly not to assimilate with them as they were doing, but his plan was for them to be separate, to come out and to rout them out of the land. The Lord is the judge, the judge of all nations, and so this poses a problem for Israel. We have questions about this. Holy war, how could it be just, right? I know we have a lot of angst about this in the Old Testament when God seems like an angry God. By the way, same God, Old Testament, New Testament, same God. If you think Jesus is the, is the shiny, happy God and, and Yahweh of the Old Testament is the mean God, I got some stuff to show you in the book of Revelation that will make your toes curl, right? Same God, right? But listen, Deuteronomy chapter 9, page 153. Deuteronomy chapter 9, page 153. Listen to what God tells Israel before they enter the land. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess the nations, greater and mightier than yourselves, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of Anakim, whom you know and whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before, them, before you. You shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. They have their command. Do not say in your heart, verse 4, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Therefore, know that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. So God is clear, it's not because his people are more righteous than the Canaanites. Morally, God looks at them, says, both sinners, right? But the Canaanites, in their wickedness, God, as the sovereign judge of the whole universe, has decided at that time to bring judgment against them. And he has decided for his own purposes to use his people, who also were sinners, deserving of judgment, to push them out. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, page 161. Starting in verse 9. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. Okay, so the, one of the reasons, one of the first ones listed here, that God is bringing judgment against the Canaanite tribes is because they, they, they practice human sacrifice. And the sacrifice they brought were their own sons and their own daughters. Can anyone say that that is not wickedness that we hope God judges? Can anyone say that? He goes on. 
Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a median or, or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you are about to dispossess listen to fortune tellers and to diviners, but as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Here, God gives us a glimpse into, into his reasons for bringing judgment against the Canaanite tribes. They practice witchcraft and, and fortune-telling, right? And God says, that's not for my people. You're to listen to me and my word. Don't you listen to those spirits. You listen to me and my word. And because they practiced child sacrifice to their gods. We could go on, we won't. Leviticus chapter 18, the whole chapter catalogs a whole list of wickedness that the Canaanite tribes were guilty of, and I'm not going to go there because I don't want to embarrass you in front of your children. Right? It gets, it gets pretty gross. All right? It was not because Israel was good that God used them to drive out the Canaanite tribes. It was because the Canaanite tribes were wicked, were evil, and God is a just judge. And because he will cleanse his earth, the world he has made, from sin and wickedness and unrighteousness. Today, as Christians, our relationship to the world is different. Now, it's important to note that Israel, at many times, was called to live at peace with those around them, unless God specifically told them he was using them as an instrument of judgment against the nations. And sometimes, Israel presumed to go to war on their, on their own, without God telling them to, and they inevitably were conquered. But our relationship to the world today is love, not war. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says to Christians, you are the salt of the earth. It says you are the light of the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God says to Christians, it's not up to you to seek justice for yourself, to seek vengeance for yourself. You leave that up to God. Vengeance is the Lord. It's, it's important to remember here that God does not say vengeance will not happen. God says, I, the Lord, claim exclusive rights to vengeance. We're called to be at peace with the world around us and yet still pursue holiness. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or, or fellowship has light with darkness? Uh, what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from the midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. God still calls us to be separate from the unbelieving culture around us. You guys know me. I'm not a culture warrior. I don't believe in fighting a cultural war. The war that we're called to fight is spiritual, first in our own hearts against sin, and then to stand as a preserving salt and illuminating light in the culture around us, to shine a light on the goodness of God and on the truth of Scripture. But God calls us to come out from the unbelieving, unrighteous culture around us and if we're honest with ourselves when we examine our lives are we really that much more faithful than Israel was in the book of Judges do we give ourselves to the gods of this age do we forget that this present order of the world is in league with Satan that Satan is still the prince and power of the air and still exercises his power through nation states and political rulers in the world now this is a theme that's not only in the Old Testament carries through into the New Testament and I know you're saying, but, but what about believers who serve in positions of power and authority in this world? Yes, and that's the way it's always been. You had Daniel in Babylon. You had Joseph in Egypt. You had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon. And yet still, God used them as salt and light in their positions. But they were within the context of an unbelieving authority structure that opposed the Lord and his works. And you say, what about... What about God-fearing unbelievers in the world? Aren't there unbelievers who exhibit morality? Yes, just like in Scripture, you had God-fearing centurions who served Caesar in Rome. Just like you had Xerxes, who God used as the king of Persia to bring his people back from exile. But even so, those people exhibiting 
the grace of God to us, though they did not believe, are still operating within an authority structure that sets itself up over against the kingdom of God. Do we, do we give ourselves to be catechized by the gods of this age? What's, what voices are discipling us? Entertainment? Social media? Unbelieving aspects of the academy? Rather than the Lord our God speaking through Scripture, are our attitudes about sex and our practices of sex more like the unbelieving culture around us or more like God's word? Our convictions regarding the sacredness of human life. Have we lost our ability to be grieved by child sacrifice which continues to happen in our world today? We still need deliverance. Our hearts have not changed from God's people's hearts. In the book of Judges, we still need rescue. We're still tempted to be assimilated into unbelieving culture. Sin is still seeking to destroy us. We're still living in a culture that's characterized by wickedness and opposition to God and his kingdom. Who, who will save us? We could, we could ask with the people of God, who shall go up first for us to fight against our enemies? There's another story here in chapter 1. Look at, look at verse 11. From there they went against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir was formerly Kirath Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kirath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. And when she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have sent me in the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now listen, what do we say? This is God's word. Every detail here is here on purpose from God. And we read it and we think, That's an odd detail to mention. Why would it be there? What do we have here in this story of Othniel? Caleb had a plan to defeat an enemy and to gain a worthy son-in-law and husband for his daughter. It's really a brilliant plan. Not only will he defeat his enemy, but he will see who, not only is brave and strong to defeat the enemy, but what did Caleb know? Remember Caleb was one of the two spies who spied out Canaan, and, and the other ten spies said, they're too big, they're too strong, we can't do it. But Caleb and Joshua said what? The Lord is with us. We can do it. The Lord is with us. Caleb understands that victory against uh, the enemies of God in the book of Judges will only come to those who trust the Lord. So he gains what? Victory over the enemies of God, which is obedience on his behalf, and also a faithful, believing son for his daughter. So Othniel rises to the occasion. He defeats the enemy. We have a faithful son who defeats an enemy and wins a bride from the father. Does this sound familiar in any way? Do you know any faithful sons who defeated enemies and won a bride given to him by the Father? Is this not the gospel by which we are saved? Jesus, the faithful Son of God, who defeats sin and hell and death and Satan in order that he might win us, the bride of Christ, the faithful, the church, to himself, given to us by the Father himself, as says in John chapter 17. And then what does the bride ask for from her father? Water. What is water a symbol of th throughout Scripture? It's not the Holy Spirit. Is this not a foreshadowing of the very gospel by which we are saved? Is this not an answer to our question, who will save us from these giants, these enemies we cannot conquer, sin within our hearts, unbelief and wickedness in the world around us? Othniel is a, is a foreshadowing of the one who can rescue us, who can defeat our enemies, who can win us as his bride, given to him by the Father, and the Holy Spirit poured out upon us that we too might share in the victory over evil and become more faithfully God's people, even in the midst of the spiritual desert, which is the world that we live in. Jesus is that righteous son, that faithful husband, that lion of Judah who defeats the wickedness of the powers of this world. 
It's him that we're called to serve. It's him that we're called to worship. It's him that we're called to follow. It's him that we're called to look to for our salvation. I want you to look at the end of the book of Judges, the very last verse. The very last verse of the book of Judges, it's repeated twice in this book. It's in chapter 17 and here at the end of the book. And this tells us what the whole book of Judges is about. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You see what a disaster it is to do everything that's right in your own eyes? You cannot trust yourself. We cannot trust ourselves to do what's right in our own eyes. When we are our own rule and our own authority, it will lead us into misery and into deeper, darker spirals of wickedness. But praise God, he's given us, he's raised up a son for us, a righteous son, a faithful son, more faithful than Othniel, to defeat all of our enemies and to draw us to himself as his bride and to purify us from all unrighteousness through the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, as we continue to study uh, the book of Judges, God, we pray that you would allow us to see your grace and your mercy and your love in the midst of all the weirdness and the violence and the suffering. God, our world is weird and violent and filled with suffering. Let us find ourselves in this story, that we might find ourselves in this world walking with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.